Hey, brother! We all know the founders of the four Hogwarts houses. Godric Gryffindor, Salazar Slytherin, Rowena Ravenclaw, and Helga Hufflepuff. And of course, we all know the basic story about these four legendary witches and wizards. They came together to form a school to better educate young minds. They built a castle and all was going well until Slytherin decided he disapproved of the kind of students they were teaching at Hogwarts. And this disagreement grew and grew until eventually Eventually, he left the school entirely, but though he was gone, history would not forget him, and 1,000 years later, the last member of his direct bloodline, Lord Voldemort, would rise up as the darkest wizard who ever lived and nearly conquer the wizarding world. A tale as old as well, a thousand years, I guess? They don't actually know when the school was founded, which is ridiculous if you ask me, given that it was a school, but like, whatever, that's not the point. Because while that might be the origin of the school, what I'm asking today is, what was the origin of the founders themselves? Where did their story come from? And surprise, surprise, the story is actually more than 1,000 years old. It's more like biblically old, like literally. This is the origin of the Hogwarts houses. Hey, Story time. Okay, so a few weeks ago I was sitting in church and my mind was wandering as it's prone to do in such situations. And as I sat there, I vaguely recall the pastor telling everyone to turn to Daniel 7, and I absentmindedly did so, flipping through the pages until I found that page. But that is about as much as I remember from that particular Sunday morning, because as my eyes stared down at the words of Daniel 7, my mind began to race at about 100 miles per hour. I knew this story. I've talked about it a thousand times, but never knew it had come from here. This was Harry Potter. This was the story of the four houses, of Voldemort, of Harry. Now, don't worry, it didn't like take me this long to realize that, you know, Harry equals Jesus, or at least a Jesus-like figure. That's, that's not the revelation I was arriving at. This was a different story. But religious affiliations or not, stick with me because these parallels are wild. Daniel 7 has two main parts. First is Daniel describing a wild dream he had of four fantastical, mythical beasts, and the second part is the interpretation of his dream. So first, let's talk about the beasts he sees in the dream because I think they may seem familiar to you. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and the mind of a human was given to it. Okay, so the lion with the wings of an eagle is actually just a griffin like griffin door. That's a pretty easy one. Gryffindor! It goes on. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. Right, and so obviously a bear is not one of the four mascots of Hogwarts, but fun fact, the original mascot for Hufflepuff was a bear, but got changed to a badger to be more European. After that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and was given authority to rule. Okay, so hands down, this one is definitely the biggest stretch as I've never even heard of a four-headed, four-winged panther before. It actually reminds me more of the Wampus from Ilvermorny, but that's a six-legged panther. Either way though, it has wings and by process of elimination is Ravenclaw because the next one is definitely Slytherin. And there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. That last beast is also described as having 10 horns. And then as Daniel thinks about the horns, another small one starts to grow and dislodges three others. And so while that's clearly not a snake because you know it has feet, the large iron teeth and devouring its victims all seem like they play very nicely with the basilisk imagery. As it does the horns, which I guess basilisks do have, even though it doesn't say that in the book, but Slytherin's wand core is actually a basilisk horn, so there you go. Like it needed more weapons. Anyway, those are the four beasts, which I think line up pretty well with the houses, but the interpretation portion of the chapter is really where things start to get crazy. Also, at this point, let me just say that I'm aware that the actual interpretation of this passage is that the beasts represent four real life kingdoms, like the lion is meant to represent Babylon, the bear, the Medo-Persian empire, the leopard is Greece, and the horned creature is Rome. 
For clarity though, I am not saying the houses represent those actual places, just that this story was a jumping off point for the houses. Cool? Great. So naturally, Daniel is most interested in that fourth beast that's crushing everything and has all them creepy horns, and this is the interpretation that he gets. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. So that is Slytherin, and the way in which he is crushing the rest of the earth in Harry Potter is by spearheading the pure blood superiority beliefs. And he's not necessarily like crushing everyone with this, but that rift he creates permeates throughout time and is what eventually leads to Voldemort and the Wizarding Wars. Back to the dream, the interpreter goes on to say that the 10 horns represent 10 kings that will come after him, him being the fourth beast, or in our case, Slytherin. This would represent the 1,000 years of time that occurs between Slytherin and Voldemort. Basically, 100 years per king, and it's the length of time that things are a problem, or the, the pure blood belief system, that is. And as you can see when we meet the Gaunts and the rest of Sirius' family, that this has been a long-standing belief for them, and while wizarding kind mostly exists peacefully, you don't have to look far to see it is indeed the pure blood families, like the Malfoys, the Blacks, and the Lestranges, who are the most rich, powerful, and influential. Back to the interpretation though, after the 10 kings will come another. Then another king will arise, different from the other 10, who will subdue three kings. This is Voldemort arriving on the scene, different from the rest, a whole new kind of evil. Lord Voldemort has seemed to grow less human with the passing years, and the transformation he has undergone seemed to me to be only explicable if his soul was mutilated beyond the realms of what we might call usual evil. But sure enough, he subdues the other three houses, eventually declaring that the house of Slytherin will be good enough for everyone. There will be no more houses. The emblem, shield, and colors of my noble ancestor, Salazar Slytherin, will suffice for everyone. Then there's also this line from the passage, which I think applies to Voldemort's reigns of terror. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time. I know that might sound confusing, like times and times and half a time, but like just, just times and half a time. So to me, that sounds like once for a long time, and that's the initial rise to power for Voldemort, and then a second shorter time, which is after he comes back in Goblet of Fire. But either way, his downfall is also predicted at the hands of Harry. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. And for reference, that's Most High, capital M, capital H, meaning Jesus, who we've already established is Harry. And sure enough, that's what happens in the story. Harry defeats Voldemort forever. You know, after returning from the dead. <laughs> Guys, we need to take a brief pause right there to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Let me ask you guys a question. How is your social battery? Are you drained, fired up? Because as the weather warms up, it seems like gatherings do as well. We're all emerging from our winter hibernation for outdoor dining, trivia nights, fire pits, parties, cookouts, you know the sort. But now is a great time to think about how much social interaction is right for you. Like, how do you recharge? Because sometimes I'll leave a party exhausted and meanwhile my wife Beth could usually go run a marathon. She is a beast like that. What's interesting though is that we can have both had a great time. You know, being tired after a party doesn't mean you didn't enjoy yourself. Like, I'm sure you've had that experience where you hang out with friends on Saturday and then just need to take Sunday to recover. It's called being an introvert, you guys. It doesn't mean we don't like hanging out with you. We do, it just means we also need to recharge by ourselves. But what I'm actually trying to say is that maybe you've never considered it before, but therapy can be a great place to learn more about what fuels you and what taxes you. Because for me, Personally, therapy has been all about setting proper boundaries, knowing not only when to say no if I'm just not up for more socializing, but also that it's okay to say no. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com super today to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash super. Link is in the description down below. And there you go, Daniel 7, the four beasts and the four houses. Like, I couldn't believe how many parallels there were until I thought about it a little bit more and realized that this story, this pattern shows up all over the place. 
There's a group of four, one of whom will conquer the other three for a time before the chosen one shows up to save the day. Like, does that remind you of anything else? Well, it should. How about, for example, the Chronicles of Narnia and the Pevensey Kids? Peter, Lucy, Susan, and Edmund. A group of four, one of whom, Edmund, decides that he's had enough and gives it all up for, uh, Turkish delight? Come on, Edmund, rose water candy? Are you kidding me? That's gotta be like the worst deal in history. <laughs> Nobody likes cup and ball. <laughs> I hope someone got that. Nonetheless though, Edmund's betrayal leads the White Witch, who's already been ruling for quite some time, to her final victory. With Edmund as her bargaining chip, Aslan agrees to trade his life for his and is apparently defeated. Except of course he's not. He comes right back to life, delivers a solid psych and whoops her butt. Also like not for nothing, but the Pevensey kids are like one for one on the founders. Am I right? Like down to the colors, genders, and personalities. Like Peter is the brave one in red. Susan is the clever one in blue. Lucy accepts everyone in yellow and Edmund is the traitor in green. Like I'm just saying, are we sure Cara Paravel is in Hogwarts? But we're also not done because this same story also plays out in Avatar The Last Airbender. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Things sure did change, and dare I say the Fire Nation basically subdued the other three nations, crushing and devouring them with its iron teeth for how long? Some even multiple of 10, no doubt? <laughs> oh yeah, 100 years. Until the most evil one of them all shows up, the Fire Lord, or honestly it might be Azula, like because almost the moment she enters the war, she starts winning it, like she takes over Ba Sing Se and Omashu, if you want to count the live action, and then she even kills the chosen one? Or does she? Obviously not, and comes right back to life, delivers the Fire Nation a solid psych, and whoops their butt. Even Pixar is a on this storyline. Like, do you recall the plot of Brave? You might not. I know mostly when we talk about Brave here, it's to do with Boo being the witch, but as a refresher, the plot unfolds like this. Or, well, actually, like, this part is only hinted at in the movie, but you can get the full story in the Pixar short movie, The Legend of Mordu. Surprise, surprise, a long time ago, there were four brothers and they all had different personalities. One was wise, like a Ravenclaw. One was compassionate, like a Hufflepuff. One was just, like a Gryffindor. And one was strong. And guess which one turns evil? Although honestly, I feel like maybe they should have seen this one coming from like a mile away. I mean, look at this guy. But yeah, so as the story goes, their father decided that all four should rule in harmony after he dies. And the strong one did not like that. So he splits off and seeks extra power from the witch who grants him the strength of 10 men in bear form. You gotta read the fine text, which he did not. Nonetheless, in bear form, he is able to finally defeat his three brothers, but then is feared so much because of his bear form that his own army abandons him and the kingdom is left to pick up the pieces for an untold amount of time, but I'm guessing like a hundred years? Until Merida shows up, turns her mom into the bear who whips Mordu's butt. I mean, I guess nobody dies in this one, but her mom does kind of lose her human life until right at the end where she's brought back and then she's like, psych, and shoves the big rock on Mordu and wins the day. I'm gonna count it. But there you go. My question for you guys is where else does this story turn up? Like, please let me know all the different versions of this story in the towel section below. Like there, it must be popping up in other places and other stories I just haven't read or heard. So if you know of other ones, let me know. The ball and cup joke was from Name of the Wind. As far as I can tell, it doesn't actually have this story in it, which is surprising because it has like every other story in it. Or maybe it does, I just haven't noticed. Who would be the Slytherin? The Chandrian? See, that would be weird though, because Lanre is the one who comes back from the dead and goes on to be Haliax, who's the leader of the Chandrian. So... But then you have Taylor, who's also a son of himself. So that would give us Haliax and the Chandrian, Taylor and the Angels, Selatos and the Emir, and the Ruach? who become the Edimaru, baby? <laughs> Anyway, also let me know if you want more Name of the Wind content. If you want more Harry Potter content and you're wondering, wow, what if Harry was in Slytherin? Ah, check out this video right here. It only lasted you about like four hours and I hope you enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite things we've ever made. Otherwise, bet until next time, I'll see you in the light, brother.